I want, number one, the West, whether America or other countries, to know that what is happening in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. Welcome to Global Perspectives. This week, it is my absolute delight to bring to you Dr. Nirvana Mahmoud. Dr. Nirvana Mahmoud is a British Egyptian medical doctor, independent political commentator, and regional observer of the Middle East. At the start of 2013, Nirvana began publishing a weekly compilation of Egyptian news reports, and she writes mainly about Egypt, liberal Islam, women's rights, and radicalism. The Washington Post and the Daily Beast both listed Nirvana Mahmoud as a must-follow Twitter account to understanding Egypt, and her blog was featured in the Economist's list of what to read on Egypt. In 2013, Nirvana was featured by the BBC as one of its 100 Women of the Year, and she currently hosts a podcast on Turkey Trends for Ahval English. Nirvana Mahmoud, it is really my honor and pleasure to have you with us here on Global Perspectives. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and honor for me too. Nirvana, um, you've been recognized by Western media as um, one of the most important voices coming out of Egypt. Could you tell our audience today, what do you think is most misunderstood about your beautiful country? Um, I th plenty actually. I think uh, one of the things is understanding the complexity of societies in the Middle East. Uh, is, Egypt is a prime example. It's wrestling with modernity, uh, it's rejection of radical Islam, but still having some aspect of Islamism uh, in the social side, which a lot of people are not aware of. But clearly, the, ma the main uh, thing which a lot of people misunderstood is how the Egyptian are uh, a warm and a pro peace, even despite the, uh, the relentless um, uh, PR agenda which advocate hate in the Middle East. Well, you know, I actually went to um, Egypt when I was uh, deputy envoy to combat anti-Semitism. I was invited for the opening of the restoration of the Great Synagogue in Alexandria. It was an incredible um, few days that I spent there. Uh, President Sisi had um, allocated a significant amount of money for restoring the Great Synagogue of Alexandria and also a Coptic church. And uh, Nirvana, you know what I've observed in my time in Egypt and, and coming back to the United States is that um, Americans have this tendency to criticize uh, the Egyptian government, not really understanding the threat of radical Islam within the society, the threat of the Muslim Brotherhood. Could you, could you expand on that a little bit more? And, and also if you could tell us about the changes that you've seen under President al-Sisi. Right. Uh uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people in America uh, and in the Western world in general uh, are not aware that Egypt in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s was a very modern pro-Western society, not necessarily in politics, but at least in, in the society is in general. Women had the rights. Long time ago, we had uh, we were uh, the Hollywood of the East. Uh, we have cinema since the early part of the 20th century, even before that. The society was always uh, embracing women's rights, uh, advocating for freedom, for individuality, until the late 70s when Islamism started to creep into the society. And it slowly, it slowly it changed it and... Uh, this change had been manifested after the revolution in 2011. So although the majority of Egyptians were pro-democracy and change, uh, they've been surprised that the Islamists hijacked the revolution and they wanted to impose a, a, a version of Islam most Egyptians were not familiar with. And that's why in 2013, there was a huge resentment and protest against the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, yes, if you ask me what happened, you know, 
uh, how this is democratic or not, I will be, that is a topic we can discuss in another time. But what I would say that whatever happened in 2013 and what people should, uh, label want to put it on it, it was backed by popularity and by popular demand in Egypt. Um, the Egyptian leadership, you can criticize it about all sorts of stuff, but I think over the year, the years uh, have proven that A, it is dedicated to the interest of the society, B, it's maintaining peace, and C, which is more important, uh, is that it, it really was making a strong stand against Taliban, Talibanization, if I may say, of the society. We don't, we, a lot, most Egyptians are pious, pious Muslim and Christian, but nobody wants to impose a version of Sharia on them. They uh, respect and uh, aspire for individualities, and they uh, reject anybody trying to push them away toward the radical extreme side. And that's why our relationship with countries like Turkey is turbulent, because the regime in Turkey, although it is democratic and uh, elected, uh, is com uh, taking the country on the opposite way of what the Egyptians aspire and want to. Nirvana, you just brought up, uh, you used the word Taliban. And uh, as you and I speak, we are kind of watching this, um, what I can't help but use the word debacle of the uh, United States uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think in the most uh, incoherent, chaotic, and self-defeating for our national security kind of way. Can you tell me as someone who's in the Middle East right now, what's your sense of what's happening right now in Afghanistan and what you think the long-term consequences are? Right, uh, uh, my, first, my first feeling of what happened in Afghanistan was a, not just deep shock, but deep fear. I, I am the generation of Egyptian who endured the Islamists in university, bullying them into have they, they have to wear the hijab, uh, they have to uh, you know uh, stick to certain, to their interpretation of Islam. I am also one of the generation of people who saw people from colleagues, acquaintances, neighbors being recruited to go to Afghanistan uh, to fight the Soviet invasion. I was young and I couldn't understand what is going on. But what I remember very well is how those Egyptians returned back to Egypt. They returned back with big beard, with huge misogyny and rejection and treat, uh, rejection of women who are not wearing the complete black. So even just the order hijab, hijab was not good enough for them. Uh, I was really mistreated by, and I had a lot of distressing incidents with those people. Uh, and one of them, I remember very well that he was a doctor. He he treated Hekmatyar, one of the Mujahideen, who was very proud that he threw sulfuric acid on the face of a woman in Afghanistan University because she refused uh, not to wear, not to cover up. The thought of empowering this kind of medievalism is distressing on all aspects. But let me put it, because there is a lot, I, I'm sure you're aware how much I'm following closely on social media and on the news. A lot of people say, but this is nothing to do with America. This is just the Middle East. This is just a Muslim world. Uh, let me remind a lot of your audience that there are Muslim Americans who will start, some of them, not all, but some of them will start to see Taliban as nothing wrong with them. The American government lies with them, handed the country to them. So what is wrong with the Taliban? Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the young who are not necessarily understand the depths or the complexity of the problem may be fooled with the propaganda going on now on social media, trying to whitewash the Taliban and make Taliban too as somehow reformed, as somehow moderate, are somehow respecting of women rights and the worst thing uh, is is trying to make criticism of Taliban as Islamophobia that's for me very distressing 
Well, uh, you know what you just shared, there, there's so much there to unpack. So I want to stay on, on your last point that you just made. Uh, Nirvana, I can tell you as someone who, uh, you know, myself born in Iran from the Middle East and uh, have such close ties back to the Middle East, um, I know that any time that I have voiced um, criticism of radical Islam here in the United States, there is always this concern of being labeled Islamophobic for having done so. What's your observation of what's going on in the West in terms of how the West is dealing with radical Islam and also the Muslim Brotherhood? Right. Uh, this Islamophobia card is, uh, I found it, it uh, fr frankly, insulting. I'm not denying that there are people who hate Muslim, whatever they do. Nobody can deny that. Racism exists anywhere and prejudice, whether it is anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, exists everywhere. However, I fear that you overusing this card is counterproductive and we should try to bridge the gap of the religious text and what the society have evolved now. Without compromising the religion, but without trying to pretend that the past was glamorous and great and wonderful because it isn't. It wasn't. What's your sense of what's going on in the Muslim world in terms of, um, you know, pushing forward the rights of women, pushing forward the rights of religious minorities and others. What I can tell you is that, again, in, in the United States, and I believe in Europe, there is this um, very loud chorus of voices that, just like you said, kind of screams Islamophobia. The minute that there is any kind of critique of, of, of what's going on in the radical Islamic world. And I think that what happens as a result is that a lot of voices are silenced, whether it's Muslims living in the West or, or other Westerners. What's your sense of what's going on in the, within the Muslim world? Is there a movement towards what, let's say in, in Judaism and Christianity, there were the reformations. Do you, do you see any kind of movement towards that, Nirvana? Absolutely. Let me highlight and go, let me go back to the point of the Taliban. The biggest difference between Taliban 1 and Taliban 2 is the evolution of the Middle East in between. Uh, what the countries who indirectly or tacitly have supported the, 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 the regimes in Afghanistan, whether before Taliban or when Taliban took over, have changed dramatically now. Saudi Arabia is not the Saudi Arabia of the 9-11. United Arab Emirates is not the United Arab Emirates of before. Uh, it was always tolerant, but even more now, if that makes sense. Egypt is not the Egypt of before. We start soul searching. We start to try to question things. We still proud Muslims, all those countries and more. Uh, but we, we start to understand the enemy from within, to listen are now standing against the Islamists. There is a big section of Libya standing against the Islamists. Uh, Morocco uh, are standing against, many Moroccan are pro-tolerance and pro-freedom. So um, what I, I can say that the, if the Taliban and the, 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 you know the biggest fear when the news come that the, the Taliban entered Kabul is that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamists have had a lifeline. They didn't. They were losing it before. And now they have a country which in the Taliban might be acknowledging the United Nations as the ruling um, uh, regime, uh, which is raising their slogan. Uh, I'm sorry, I talk forever, so feel free to stop me. No, that's fine. No, Nirvana, you know, um, you know, everything you're saying, I think, is so important for our audience to understand. Um, so so I want to stay on this point for a minute longer. Um, you used this this phrase. You said the enemy within uh, mm. in referring to the radical Islamists within the Middle East and the soul searching, the soul searching that took place after 9-11 in, in many, many uh, Middle Eastern societies, Middle Eastern North Africa. What do you think the West needs to do in terms of helping the Middle East, North Africa conquer the enemy within? Right. It's important, first of all, for the West to understand that those people are not just confined to the Middle East. I remember my mother had a discussion with an American lady in the 80s, warned her about the danger of political Islam. And she told her, 
Uh, but that is a Middle Eastern issue. Why it's America should be bothered about that. And you know what? After 9-11, she sent us a card and, and she told us, now I understand what you're talking about. Uh, I want, number one, the West, whether America or other countries, to know that what is happening in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. There are Muslims around the world. There are younger generation who doesn't understand the problem and the risk and the pitfall. They just see themselves as they want to be pious. They want to connect with their faith. But to try to guide them of what is piety and what is political exploitation of the faith is very tricky because as we talked before, those people play the Islamophobic card. Those people are trying to blur the difference. It is their job to, to, to serve their ideology to blur the difference. And it is, while well, I am humbly trying, and many, many, many more are trying to uh, differentiate uh, and make the difference why, loud and clear. Uh, when, when the Arab Spring rejected the Islamists, it was spent in the media as uh, undemocratic. We can talk about what is democracy and what the idealism of democracy forever. I would love to have a secular liberal democracy. But that doesn't, not, uh, strategic patience is what uh, someone used this term, it's not mine, but it is, is, should be applied on all sorts of stuff. And you have to apply on the evolution of nation. The Afghanistan didn't have a chance for a proper evolution. We did have semi chance, but they are trying to sabotage it for us. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying about strategic patience. And, and also, again, I think one of the tendencies that the West has is to um, superimpose its own history and its own values on regions all around the world, not understanding the basic cultural differences and certainly the political differences. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, 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 at one point, sorry to interrupt, but I, I, you, you mentioned you hit the chord here, but here is the double sword. The Islamists say, don't impose your value on us. Our women want to cover up. No, there are basic human values that Muslims, Christian, atheists, Jewish people, everybody agree with, which is the right of people to show their past in life. But after that, yes, when you talk about politics and imposing a certain political system on us, this is something we can agree to disagree about putting it within context. You know, I, I so much appreciate that clarification, Nirvana, because um, it, what you just said is exactly what I think, which is basic human rights. That's something that every human being has the right to. Um, but it's more about about political systems. Um, and so, Nirvana, I want to um, move yeah. us uh, the conversation a little bit now to um, your country, Egypt, and your neighbor, Israel. With the the peace treaty that President then President Sadat signed with the Israelis, we saw so what, what many term a cold peace between Egypt and Israel. And as you know, most recently we had these uh, Abraham Accords um, peace deals that the Trump administration brokered, which are now warm peace deals between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and then Morocco, Sudan, and Israel. I'm just curious from your viewpoint, are you seeing Egypt uh, and Egyptian society perhaps more ready for, for joining these Abraham Accords countries in, in having a, a warmer peace with Israel? Well, the, re the evolution of Egyptian uh, peace uh, or relationship with Israel is completely different than the countries you mentioned. We had several wars. So a lot of Egyptian family had relatives who, who, who were killed and lost in the war, and this has left a psychological trauma. Uh, and especially that, uh, you know, some of the wars, like the 67 wars, wasn't particularly, you know, uh, we, had the, uh, we didn't have the outcome that Egyptians were aspiring for. Uh, so without talking about that, the evolution of the peace is difficult process. What I can tell you that, I don't believe it is warm's, the warm versus cold peace, uh, peace, but I believe it is an informed peace versus um, lack of understanding of what peace is about. Uh, you know what? And I hope you don't mind me saying that. I say to the people who reject the normalization, um, you don't, uh, 
no, you need to normalize with Israel to understand it if you want to disagree with it or even fight it. The problem I, well, I see is complete ignorance of Israel. We created an iron wall and we somehow start to see the Israelis as if they are aliens coming from a different planet, not human beings. Like, we, there are we, there are different type of enemies. Uh, like, the Egyptians are not necessarily warm to, be, to the Brits because of the history of colonialism, okay? Or the French because of the history of colonialism. But if you give them a French um, perfume, they will say, oh, la, la. But if you give them an Israeli perfume, they will say, God forbid, what on earth is this? You know, as if it's toxin. And you just feel like if you we start to work on that basic premises that at least the Israelis are people like us, human being, you can agree, disagree, you want one state, two state, whatever, love, hate, is, is not the point I'm trying to, to make here. All I'm saying that I want you to see them as fellow human beings with their faults, with their, uh, all the things you might disagree with. They, they even, I'm sorry again to say, and I hope you don't mind my honesty, they always assume that the Jews are all the Einstein level, uh, like they all plotting. Like if, if, a, if a Jewish person say to them good morning, they will start to wonder why he's saying good morning. And, and I found that pathological. I fight this pathology more than I advocate for anything, because if we start to see uh, us as neighbors who have interest, who have, um, you know, common uh, enemies, uh, who have strategic, uh, you know, benefits for both of us, then the gradual psychological aspect will be uh, evolved by itself. Of course, I want a, a, a solution to the Palestinian conflict. All Egyptians want that. But one of the things from 2011 till now, that they start to see the pitfall of, of what Gaza is imposing on Egypt. And, and, and they, don't, they stop seeing it from just a romantic perspective. Well, that's a huge advance, I think, uh, for, for Egyptian society to understand um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from, from the perspective of Gaza, and I'm really happy to hear about that. Um, Nirvana, you also kind of, I think, were referencing um, almost like conspiracy theories about Jews, right? And so let's, let's talk about anti-Semitism in the Middle East. You know, what, uh, my, in my um, work as the Deputy Envoy to Combat Anti-Semitism, what we understood about the MENA region is that anti-Semitism is institutionalized so that it was, it, it was historically across the region being taught in um, textbooks in, Jew, in children's schools. It was being preached by some uh, imams in mosques, and it was in the media. Where do you think the state of anti-Semitism is in Egypt today? And are you at all hopeful that, um, that Egyptians can move on from this kind of Jew hatred? You know, I see two groups in the Middle East, and they are big in Egypt. The Nasserists, the pro-Nasser, or the leftists in general, and the Islamists. Both have an agenda uh, to, to, to promote hatred. Uh, because they are clinging to the problem, they are not interested in the solution. The people who are usually pro-peace are the people who want solutions. They want to solve the problem. Like, look, where is the problem? Is it a land? Is it two people? It, and they try to at least have a discussion about that. But the groups I mentioned, they are not interested in all this. They are interested on maintaining the problem, on, on, uh, on benefit from it. That's why hate for them is an essential part of their survival, okay? And, and the more I see that the leftists and the Islamists are regressing from the Middle East, the more I'm optimistic about the future. Uh, and uh, as I say, I always tell people, just look, the number of Egyptians who have a scholarship abroad and then happen to see a Jewish person for the first time and how... Deep down, they might not express it, but deep down feel shock. And I raised my hand. I was the first person. When I saw a Jewish family for the first time, I was a doctor. Uh, and it, it, I was busy with the, how I'm going to treat the lady, but I was also looking at them as if I saw something I never saw before. And it, 
it saddened me later that I felt that way, but that's the, the years of ignorance. Nirvana, can we, just to stay on this for another moment, what about perceptions of Zionism in the Middle East? Right. I believe, uh, this is my own personal opinion, that I don't think anybody in the Middle East uh, understands Zionism properly. They make their own understanding of the Zionism as if it is Zionism. Uh, and, uh, and then they build conclusions based on that. They, to, to have, to under, like, if I want to understand uh, pro Biden, for example, I will want to sit with that person, listen to him, why he voted for Biden, etc., to make an understanding of the problem. But we never stood with the Zionists to hear from them, to make a decision, informed decision about what is Zionism. And that's the biggest problem, in my humble opinion. Uh, I believe Zionism is an identity issue. And as the Jewish people have struggled with their identity, whether they belong to just the, their, their, you know, the countries, the roots, or the country of origin or their family origin, or whether the relationship between that and their religion and the Israel, etc. It's a very multifaceted relationship. We do have this struggle of identity. Are we Muslim first? Are we Egyptian first? Are we Arab first? Etc. Etc. So we do have our, our own struggle. And I believe in a reflective conversation about how both of us feel toward our identity will probably solve plenty of issues. We might still have, have to have a huge disagreement, but at least it will be based on less hate, less emotion, more understanding. You know what? If I receive that, I will feel I achieve something. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think it would advance um, peace efforts tremendously. Um, so I just want to ask you again on, on the question of Zionism. Do you think there's a perception in the Middle East that um, Zionism is, is the Jewish people's um, right to their homeland, that the Jewish people are indigenous to Israel, that it's, you know, in the Bible, um, Abraham, our, you know, mutual prophet, Moses, our mutual prophet between Judaism and Islam, um, that, for example, Moses in, in the Bible, right, he leads the Jewish people from Egypt to Israel. Um, do you think there's an understanding that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people and that Zionism is the, is the return to the ancient Jewish homeland, and that the Jews are here to stay in, in Israel? No, I don't think there is any understanding. I, I mean, I, I, I obviously, I don't want to generalize. There are people who put some effort to understand. But in general, people see the Zionists as colonial power, and they will about to leave, like the Crusaders or the Brits or the French or whoever. Uh, and I believe that is our own premises. Uh, and I believe Zionists is a way of of what you mentioned, the history, the religion, the link to the homeland, but it's also a bridge to make the Jewish people comfortable with modernity. Because Israel is different, being an Israeli is different than being a Jew. Uh, the Israeli can be, uh, might not observe Sabbath, uh, might, uh, might sit with bikini on a Tel Aviv beach, okay? might not even go to a synagogue and still believe that he is a loyal citizen of the state of Israel. If, if you know, the Islamists are trying to narrow the debate about what is Israeli to the religious text, and I find that disturbing because that's not what Israel is built about. And, and if we start to, de, um, uh, you know, uh, separate the religious side from, yes, the religion is important, uh, uh, and what is a Jewish person uh, is important, but also try to understand that Israel had evolved or made uh, what Ben Gurion made uh, for the Jewish people is a package, which is not just the religion. Uh, and we need to understand that if we're going to build bridges or at least stop. 
Nirvana, you know, you're exactly right also about an Israeli because certainly there are Christian and Muslim, um, Druze, Israelis, and so to be Israeli doesn't even necessarily mean to be Jewish. Um, so, so that your, you know, your analysis is spot on. Um, so before, before we say goodbye, Nirvana, I just am curious if there's any um, last kind of thought or message that you have for our audience that you would like them to, uh, to understand. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I, I, my last message is asking the audience is not to listen to one person. The Middle East and the Muslim world is very complex and it is in the process of evolution. Uh, and I am not asking the American to even understand or even uh, change. I am asking them to uh, not to make things worse. Uh, but that is the part I'm pleading with them to do. Listening to those uh, who you uh, denying Islamism is making things worse. Making deals with the radicals is making things worse. Uh, expecting hatred as part of the package of the Middle East is expecting things worse. Don't push things on us, but at least don't make things hard for those who are trying to build bridges. Such an important message. I am, I'm really thrilled, Dr. Nirvana Mahmoud, that you joined us today on Global Perspectives. Thank you. And, uh, and I hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much, Eli. The ple pleasure and honor is mine. Dr. Nirvana Mahmoud used the language, the enemy within, to describe the threat of radical Islam to the Middle East and North Africa. The question for us in the West is whether we will support the millions of people throughout the Middle East and North Africa region who are ready to confront this threat, or if we in the West ourselves will allow ourselves to become victims to this very same threat. Thank you for joining me on Global Perspectives and join me the next time.